Today, I'm going to talk about uh, our recent paper, mainly, uh, which I just like call offline reinforcement learning via symmetries of dynamics, which we also presented at the ICML this year. It's with like Sam and uh, Animesh from the Vector Institute in Toronto and my PI here, Kishinobo. So just quickly, like we have heard about it, but like that's that slide is mandatory. So in a reinforcement learning setting, we, we have an environment in which the, the agent can take actions, right? And it observes the reward and observation with this action. And then usually, as we have seen also before, we have that the agent is composed of a, a critic, which evaluates, you know, how good is this data mean? How good is my observation? And like, what is the best action to take? Which is then given by the policy of the agent. Right, so I'm mainly gonna talk about offline RL today, which uses a static uh, training data set. And in particular, that means that further environment exploration is not possible, right? So we call this framework uh, Koopman Q-learning because we learn a, a Koopman uh, latent representation, which from them we infer symmetries of the dynamics of the system. And we then utilize the symmetries to extend the uh, data set. Right, so here's a very simple example of the, of the mountain car, right? So the car has to reach the, the top of the hill uh, and it actually has not enough power to do that. So it has to oscillate forth and back, right? And so let me turn this. So this is just like a illustrative example, right? So we, we uh, plot uh, trajectories from expert policy and we see that all of them reach the goal on the top right, right, after some certain time. And you can see that even for the simple example, which is a one-dimensional uh, example governed by an ordinary differential equation, the, you know, the, the state space, or the, even for the expert policy alone, is, is quite well, complex. And so we can transform these uh, observables and actually in a five-dimensional space. So below I show projections, like three-dimensional projections in the Koopman observables, and we see that in particular on the right side, it's like, it says all different perspectives of the same thing. Uh, we see that it's like a circle, right? So the dynamics then given by the Koopman operator, which is a linear operator acting on the Koopman observables, basically amounts to rotation here on the right side. Right, so, so symmetries, right? We just like very briefly, they appear everywhere in nature. Here we have the rotation and the, the mirror flip. Those are global symmetries. But today we're going to mainly talk about local symmetries. Well, this is just like a, a, a figure here, right? So local symmetries can be very different as the global symmetries. Here would be, for example, a local approximate shift symmetry, right? Comparable to the global mirror flip. So in particular, so I'm, I'm going to be very uh, uh, rare with, with formulas today. So, but here's one. So the symmetries we're talking about are actually local Lie groups and they basically have to obey the, the three properties that there's an identity element, right? That they can be composed like either way, so that's commutative. And also like they admit the Taylor series expansion. That means for every point locally, I can like, like write the symmetry shift as like a, as a linear shift in epsilon, some function theta of S. Right, so why is this important to us? So what you'll find is that, so if that is again like the state space of the environment and like this black line here is a trajectory from the initial condition TI to TF, right? So let's say this, imagine it's an expert uh, policy acting on a state space and this will give you this trajectory in the uh, in state space in the environment. So the often data set obviously contains this information, but we are very limited, right? So it would be nice to have like an elaborate way of generating new data, which is like with some high re reliability, like resembles the dynamics of the original system. And this can be done locally by this local symmetry shift. So you can just imagine, in fact, it, it shifts like the trajectory locally to, 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 to a nearby trajectory with a different initial condition, right? So all of these trajectories still are governed by the same dynamics of the system, which we of course uh, don't know in general, right? So we have to learn it. Right, and so those trajectories are not contained in the original data set. And the idea is that providing more data to the algorithm during training then will enhance the performance. So 
how how do we approach this right so the it's actually quite simple you just have to pre-train like basically this variation autoencoder which has the additional feature that it is basically just a, if you take the identity map on the latent space you get just st so the same state however if you want to apply the linear operator, which is the Koopman operator, which is just like a matrix multiplication on a latent variable, you will get the a next uh, state. So the, the, the state at the next time step. And the answers for the, the Koopman operator, as I said, is just linear. Here's a K0 and Ki are just matrices, and Ai are the actions taken, right? And what we actually find, so this is the, the theoretical result, is that you can get a symmetry transformation or a symmetry generator. So sigma is a symmetry generator if and only if it commutes with uh, the, the Koopman operator. Right? So commute means yeah, k times sigma minus sigma times k equals zero. And then, as I mentioned before, as soon as we have the symmetry, we can take a data point, which here is again like we take st plus one and st, right? So it's actually two points in a side dimensional state space. And we can transform across along different symmetry directions, right? Because we're not going to only find one symmetry, we're going to find in generically different symmetries. But however, to, to stay numerically stable, we restrict this to like an epsilon, epsilon ball region around the original data point. And we will then generate, as I said, like these new valid data points in this epsilon ball. So let's make a sanity check on how well the algorithm performs. So on the, on the top left, you see D4RL, which is a benchmark data set by Fu et al. And we just plot one of the, I think this is like maybe medium expert, one of the trajectories from medium expert data set of the Walker. And there has been some paper which they, the authors call S4RL, in fact, by our collaborators. Um, we, they randomly shift the state space and see that already just like random augmentations uh, even on this continuous action space, leads to a performance in the in the results in the reward function. And however, you see that like it's it's quite like it doesn't really resemble very, sometimes the, the the dynamics. However, on the bottom you see our symmetry shifts, like the small and large basically epsilon ball region shifts, and like the shifted state looks very much like the original dynamic. Right. So let me say here like it's supposed to be chumpy because we shift every data point with a different like symmetry direction and symmetry magnitude, right? So it's not expected to be another smooth like running walker, but rather that every, basically every frame transition, so from one frame to another looks reasonable, which it uh, very much does, right? So, so what we can also do is like, although the algorithm only uses local symmetries, we can just make a check if like actually our approach can also recover global symmetries. And we just test this on the card pole and in fact, like the global translation symmetry uh, is, is naturally like derived or is, self, is learned in a self-supervised fashion by in this Koopman latent, latent representation. So the, the way to use that is like, so we, we put our framework on top of CQL, which is conservative Q-learning, which is the state of the art for model three reinforcement learning with several modifications. And we only modify the policy optimization step. And in a very naive way, we just modified the, the Bellman error with the, the symmetry shift here, where E is the, the Koopman space embedding. So it embeds the, uh, the state space, the continuous state space variable into the Koopman observable. And then we apply the, the symmetry shift. So we again shift by epsilon ball. So we take the identity plus the symmetry generator, right? Which gives us this local Lie group acting on the Koopman uh, observables. And then, of course, we have to take the inverse embedding to embed back to the uh, state space, which can then be used for training. And uh, epsilon here is a normally distributed random variable, just like it has been proven empirically useful, not to use that as a, like a you know, fixed parameter, but introduce some randomness here. That's why also like in the expression above, you see uh, as twiddle d, uh, conditional from st plus one. That means basically it's the, the probability only comes from this random error over here. And we call this framework uh, Koopman forward conservative uh, Q learning. 
or short KFC. So like very, very, very briefly, so the empirical tests, we, we perform a wide range of experiments. In fact, we uh, test our method on the entire D4RL data set. Uh, and, and you can see here the ant maze. So in the top left, the, you know, the, it's, it's very small, but I hope you can uh, see it. Uh, the ant has to uh, find the way in the maze. Then of course the mutual code tasks, like which are very familiar, like the walker, and half cheat and so on and so forth, but also like the Franca kitchen and the outright right tasks. And moreover, we uh, perform robotic manipulation tasks as well. So uh, the benchmarks are famously the RoboSuit and uh, which, you know, the robotic arm has to manipulate uh, certain uh, objects. And below is like the meta world tasks, right? Where it's, it's very similar. Uh, but we, we don't perform the meta experiments. We just like see if our algorithm can actually learn the, the dynamics of this process and how well it performs. So right, so the, the empirical results of the KFC and what we call KFC++, which are just two different ways of uh, getting, so the difference between KFC and KFC++ is the way the symmetry transformation is, is derived from the Kuchmann operator. And you can ask, I can tell you later in detail how that is done, but it's basically just like two different algorithmic ways of saying, okay, I have a matrix, right? I know the matrix and I want something which commutes with this matrix, basically. Right? And, and, and we see that like, while S4L actually has improved CQL last year to be the, the uh, quite, quite significantly, we find that KFC and, and in particular KFC++, again, in average give a quite a improvement over uh, uh, yeah, CQL and S4RL respectively. And so briefly what I mean here, so the task name, I mean like when I say trim, I mean all the mutual code tasks, right? So this is an average over all the data sets, which is for example, the, the replay data set. So, so you know, every, every environment like the Walker 2D has like different data sets, right? It has the, well, it has the random one, it has the medium expert one, it has the medium one, it has the uh, replay buffer one. And like the average of all tasks, right? And the score here is the, is the normalized score. So roughly 100 is, is, is you know, for every environment is, is basically what, what, what you can possibly achieve. And right, so yeah. And the same for uh, Ant Maze, we, 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 we average over all different data sets and for Adroid and Franca, and we find that the, well, the score is improved. Uh, for the, uh, the meta world and the RoboSuit environments, however, we only take uh, very specific tasks, which I list here, you know, for the, the meta world environments, we, we tested on the push, the door close, the sweep into and the reach wall environment. And for the RoboSuit, the, the big place can and the, the block lift. So only two in fact, right? And so where the robotic arm has to do like, you know, two different tasks and in green and blue, we have again the KFC++ and KFC, and we see the same pattern, right? So KFC++ is always a little bit better than KFC and is better than uh, CQL. In, in the in plus S4L, which are the random shifts, right? So they, they have one variant of it, which performs the test, and we have taken this as a baseline here. So concludingly, we actually find that our method improves the state of the art of the model free, for model free reinforcement learning like quite consistently over this wide uh, range of tasks. So I, I've, I've been uh, intentionally brief here with, with the first part because I wanted to, to spend the second part on, on giving, a, giving a little bit like uh, an idea. So what we're working on right now and, and what, is the, what is the motivation behind the, the research uh, we, we are doing. And so what we've done here uh, in particular is to provide a, a method for out of distribution generalization, right? So like the symmetry, symmetry transformations give you a, a, a reliable way to generate new data, which are not in original distribution, but which, which resemble them quite closely. And the hope is since those are symmetries, the, it's not a trivial shift, right? It's not something you could uh, get easily otherwise. So, there's different, 
however, category which people look at, which is varying environment generalization, which I, which for example means I, I have an end and the end now has to carry a backpack, right? Or is heavier. And how well does my algorithm adjust to these kind of changes? And there's, and, and the, the, maybe the biggest challenge here is, is task generalization in, well, in which we learn that the robotic arm, for example, has to learn how to pick up a block. And then without like, you know, telling it the new task, it has to learn how to, I don't know, open a door, right? Something completely different, which obviously is not covered in, in, in this work. So again, so here, this, this, the first category we addressed with these coupon representations, it would be interesting to apply this to model-based RL, right? That's something we've been thinking about. And so let me come to the generalization of varying environments. So what people have done is, for example, they have added like wind, right, to the end, or make the legs longer or shorter, right? And then there's this other one for games in particular, you, you have the same, well, it's basically the same distribution, but you sample for the uh, training set and for the test set, you sample from, right, uh, for, for different parameters of the same distribution, basically. So you see that the background is different, like the options have different color. It's like different, maybe like structure. And the, the benchmark here is the Brockham benchmark, which has been uh, quite interesting. So, and it turns out surprisingly, uh, image augmentation is, is all you need for, uh, for those tasks, right? So, I mean, it's image augmentation, I mean, really naive, like the standard, like uh, cropping, translation, rotation, cutout stuff, right? And to achieve generalization, at least for, you know, for, for changing background color, like those image augmentation has achieved Quite, uh, has performed quite well. However, the pitfall is that it overregulizes due to the, the naive augmentation methods, right? So here's like just like uh, uh, a plot taken from the Luskin et al. paper, no, oh, sorry, from the Hansen and Wang paper, which gives you the mean and uh, Q error for different uh, augmentation methods. And, and well, and I think this is for the walker, so it will even vary for the environment, right? And here you see this, the same thing, right? It's just like a different graphic. You see uh, the, the, on top you see that the Brockian environments jumper, star the big fish, and at the bottom you see the test environment. So the training versus dust environments, just like to give you an idea. And on the right you see like how different um, augmentation methods perform, right? And I'll give you a second to look at it because of it. So, so the baseline is the black one. So you see some of them in fact, perform just better and something even worse than a baseline in a training process, right? So where the time steps are in millions. And, and, the, the, and the basic state of the art to approach this is to say, okay, I'm, I'm using a selective way, right? I'm, I'm, I'm kind of self-supervised to learn the, which augmentation method is best. And like we're approaching this challenge a little bit different. This is a collaboration with uh, Rishabh uh, Agarwal at Google. And we try to, to think of like, um, the idea that inductive bias in the policy network, right, and value network can actually like replace augmentation methods to some extent. And very, very, very simple. What we do is we actually have like um, a tension mechanism, which however can be interpreted uh, like as a graph and we preserve the graph symmetries, right? So graph symmetries, for example, here of the, of the walker would be like translation. So you can shift the graph, right? Or you just mirror it. And on, on top of that, you, you can you can rotate the graph, right? Right. Right. The brief thing we call this graph symmetric attention. I will be very brief here since this is actually work in progress. Uh, but the idea is that you get like uh, a latent representation, which which then admits certain symmetries, right? And why is that relevant, right? Just like in a simple example of of the of the grid world, right? You you can generalize, just to say, okay, I, I instead of so, okay, so, so first of all, the goal here is to go get to get the key and get, go to the green square, right? So, but what does it say if a turn is around, right? And say, okay, the green square is not in the bottom right corner, but in the top left corner. Right? It turns out that most algorithms will not generalize, right? To the simple naive generalization. Of course, this is just a rotation. So, you know, in a way, like we should be able to do, you know, the, the algorithm should be able to do that. 
and in, in the bottom you want to channelize to a different more difficult setting right the, the this is called lava crossing where the orange fields are lava and the, the agent cannot fall into the lava but has to find the pathway and in the end again reaches the the, the green square right so another generalization benchmark which uh is quite uh well which is basically like state of the art is called the destructive control suite and the, the goal here is to to actually not take the same distribution for the desktop, but it's actually a different distribution. This is achieved by using like a, a wide set of range of videos, right? It's a high resolution, relative to high resolution videos in the background, and also shifting the, the camera angle position and like during, um, well, during testing. And it, and it turns out that the current state of the art uh, algorithms cannot even learn, right? The, so this is training from pixel data. I should have mentioned this, right? Obviously, um, cannot even learn, despite test on uh, across this like third third difficulty level, right? So there's a a full set of like, right? There's wide range for improvement. Right. So, so I've now so uh, covered the the middle part, which describes the idea of how to, uh, you know, uh, generalize to pixel-based RL, so to varying environment generalization as like done in these few benchmarks. But like there's something else which we are interested in, which is task generalization. And, and of course, by that, I mean, this is basically meta RL. So there, there's the inner loop. The inner loop here in this picture describes the normal uh, training process, right? So the agent performs an action in the environment, gets the reward and observation. Ho however, the, 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 the policy and or the agent has to perform a wide set of um, environments, right? So different tasks. And this is most often done by viewing the different tasks as like a contextual um, variable or like this is formalized in a contextual market decision process. Right? However, it turned out that like it's, it's competitive to this strategy, you can just use uh, meta Q learning for a multitask objective, right? So you just say, okay, I'm tra training my normal Q learning algorithm on, on all of these tasks and it performs roughly comparatively well, right? So it, it is that kind of like hints to the fact that there is still, there should be some room to improvement in my opinion. And so briefly what I mean by that, so multitask reinforcement learning, that's not what we're talking about. It's like, I don't want to have learn a lot of tasks very well. But what I want to do is I want to learn learn from several tasks and then be able to quickly adapt to a completely new task, right? And although we have tested our previous algorithm already on the meta world, we've actually not done any task generalization, right? Because that was not the goal, not, not to be confused what we've done in the in the in the work I presented in the first part of my talk. But but here, right, so again, this is just like to repeat on the left side you see a set of tasks on the right side for testing, you see a different set of tasks, which the algorithm uh, then should quickly be able to learn without having seen it at training time. Right, so there, there's there's like a, a last like uh, perspective to that, which is there's also generalization to new strategies, right? So this is also something which I would Put under the umbrella of uh, meta RL. And this is usually done by a population of N agents which interact in the same environment and are, are learned from each other. And a famous example for that would be AlphaGo, right? So the two agents play against each other the Go game and it improves them. Well, the same agent plays against itself and, and improves their, their own strategy. So it's, it's and the, the, the critical part here is how to have a, a, a meta strategy who guides the learning process, right? And this, in this population um, learning framework, the game theoretic perspective has been widely used. And like, in fact, we are working on, on one, one approach right now. And mainly we are working on a collaborative one, but of course in an alpha goal game, for example, you have like the adversarial approach, right? And of course you can combine those to get both, right? So to summarize, like, the, the theme of our work, which I presented in the first part of the talk, aimed to, to accomplish generalization, out of distribution generalization, 
in a uh, continuous control tasks, right? But it's, it is like part of a, a bigger uh, re research uh, like theme I'm trying to follow with several collaborators to, to approach generalization to also like these other, what I would call other categories of generalization, which is, you know, varying the environment, so varying actually the dynamics of the environment, right? Or the, the composition, like the background color, or even like generalizing to new tasks, right? And in the end, also generalizing to new strategies, how to solve a problem. Good. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. So then, Volkan, do you have a question? Uh, yes. So thank you for the, the, the very nice talk. Um, if I understand correctly, um, in the first part, you talk about Q learning in a way that is model free. And you're trying to use maybe invariances, something like uh, unsupervised learning, in order to augment your data and somehow do better. Uh, is is this correct? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good way to say it. So it's in a way it's a it's a it's a new principled uh, way for data augmentation. Okay. Uh, so we do not really uh, like make any changes to the CQL algorithm, right? Other than using the, the augmented data training time. Okay, I actually like this because I mean, somehow you you think about even let's say encoding the the Q function with a neural network, and then somehow by doing these invariances, you end up getting something structured with it, right? Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, have you noticed if if you work with these things, did it lead to convolutions? Did it lead to maybe? some architectures that somehow are known to work certain invariances? Did, did you try some of the uh, practical uh, things? So, so this is not really like the invariance of the architecture itself. So what we used for the, for, for the, for the variation altering for we just use the MLP, mm -hmm. right? So, so there, there is basically no, uh, well, there's no, so the invariances are not invariances of the neural nets. The invariances should be really like part of so I have like a dynamical system, right, which is governed by differential equations. So I think that I, that I got, I, I, I meant that oh, do sorry. the invariances also get reflected in the, the, let's say, the function that you learn somehow, which is the neural network, right, not the vice versa. So you try to enforce invariances in the data, you end up maybe do data augmentation, and then you start training representations, and you know, right now there's a lot of unsupervised learning work with representations, and some of these, you know, um, I don't know, maybe things like shift invariance result in convolutions and things like this. Um, what I was saying yeah, is, right, do right. you also make that connection that in the deep Q learning world, that these Koopman invariances uh, would prefer a certain type of architecture? versus another in order to encode these kind of invariances. Okay, right. right. So, yeah, that so was actually, yeah, I have a stupid question before. Yeah, I have a stupid question before, but I, I wasn't sure, like, in what way you would hope to, to achieve that. Because, okay. like, as we said, the... So, so I, I, I know, for example, that, you know, you know shift similarity leads to convolutions. Right, so that's actually a little bit more close to the, to the second part, where is that what we should be working on right now, which is inductive bias for, um, in fact, for vision transformers, right? But, but it's a, well, it's different from the question, but, the, the, the invariances are really, those are local leak groups, right? So, okay, so- They're local, yes, so, okay. I'm not about that, but I would not be aware of like any, because this is really a local transformation, right? So, so we're not looking at global transformations, which might be future work, right? To extend it like, to, you know, to say, okay, I, I have, I don't, I don't know, you know. I mean, the, maybe- the global transformation, hmm? the, the Somehow you can use the global transformation, the model based are out case. You mentioned that you're looking into this um, because if you have certain uh, model for the transition dynamics, you can also perhaps encode global invariances along with the local. Um, right, right, right. So, so okay, yeah. So, so what you could do is so, for example, for the Waco 2D, right? So even like for the model three case, so what people usually do, they truncate the position from the from the training variable, right? So the position, the absolute position of the walk or health sheet or whatever is not used for the training. And the reason is because it's super confusing for most like <laughs> uh, Q-learning algorithms, right? Because it's actually completely, irre it's ir irrelevant because there's a symmetry and people truncate it. So what you could say, what you could ask is, we have not done that. 
since our method self-supervised learns all the global symmetries, right? It should, in principle, perform better if you would actually not naively truncate this from the, from all experiments a priori, mm. right? So, so that's one thing we thought about doing, but we actually did, didn't. Have, well, we don't have any empirical results in that. We didn't do it because it's kind of established that you just like you assume it's such an obvious symmetry, right? You just truncate the the everybody does it, right? Even like the environments themselves, right? They, they if you get the observation, it's truncated, right? So the position is truncated. So, so that's the one thing and. Right. Sorry. Was there a second question? Yeah. Uh, well, I actually have one more question, if you don't mind. <laughs> uh, sure. no. You talk about multi-agent <laughs> setting, yeah. and I think that you're going to do the lifting on the multi-agent setting. So, you, as opposed to looking at individual agents, you would like to find the distribution of, let's say, uh, um, policies or value functions or Q functions over agents. Is that what you meant at the end? Uh, in the multi-agent setting, uh, yeah. Think, here you mean, or? Uh, I think the next slide that you were showing that there, there are population learning fr framework, right? And a game right, theoretic right. perspective. So did, did you mean here that you want to learn the distribution over the agents? So population games there, right. sometimes when you have too many agents, you don't learn individual things, but you learn the distribution over them, right? Is, is, but I, is think, the, I think the different. They're different, okay. Right, so I think there are, there are different approaches implemented in the, in the literature. So we are by far not the first people to do that, right? So so what people have been doing in, in I think the, the original work by Balanchdor et al, I think it's cited here, is to say that, well, well they, they, they consider something like called the response oracle, which is like, uh, well, it's, it's basically what, what it does is like, it's a normal form game. So if, so each agent plays against another agent, let's say, or like it le learns to improve the other agent, but it's that the agent itself is does not uh, has not access to the. So I'm just describing it not a meta strategy, right? To to say how the learning process works, and the meta strategy there would be, okay, I, I I let one player play against the other, but I don't get give them the full set of options, right? And basically let them say if there is if they if they at least like if they can extend their options, if they will then be able to improve. Uh, their their performance over these agents. So that's kind of the meta strategy there, and that's what what I mean by game theoretic, right? It's really like one agent plays another other. The population, I, I think, is is as soon as you have a, in that sense, in that paper, is as soon as you have an agent which performs better than the other agent, you actually just say, okay, then I, I, I you know, I I, I I add this to my population, right? It's basically in the in the pot of agents which perform well, and you just like add, keep adding agents. But I, I think I agree with what you say. Like there are there are papers out there which then say, okay, this could maybe be phrased as like, okay, as a distribution of agents, right? I, I mean, I, I, I'm yeah, that's what I was. Well, but it seems very reasonable that people would do that, right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Other questions? Can I also follow up this part? Uh, I'm also sure. interested in the multi-agent scenarios, but it was not so clear to me what was the the real challenge here compared with a single agent scenario. Would you recapitulate it again? Ah, so, so for this case or for this case? Uh, next page. Next page, next page. Right, so, so you mean the, 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 the challenge here? So yeah, the so you have, you have N agents now interacting in the same environment. Right, right, so, so th this approach usually is used for for example, for, for the game goal, right? So you, you, you do not, you know the rules, but you don't have any, there are, for example, too, too many options to ever have like a data set, right? To say to train from. I mean, you can do it, but it's not gonna perform well, right? So the challenge is like twofold. So the challenge is, okay. Well, the challenge for the, the multi-agent setting, I think is that if you, so one, one open challenge, is if you have too many agents and you want to optimize with respect to too many agents, basically it just becomes numerically very hard to do, right? That's one challenge, but you are, I think, asking what is the, but you're not asking for a technical challenge, you're asking for what, what is the, the channel challenge behind this framework or what is the question? Yeah, maybe from your perspective. From, from my perspective, you, So, right, so uh, 
from, from my perspective, I the challenge is that, well, there have been certain approaches to, to use that, and most of them use the Nash equilibrium as, as the guiding principle, which is, you know, Nash equilibrium in, in a game tells you that if you if you have two players, that it's optimal for them, so they don't have to change their, their either of them has to change their strategies, right? And that has been kind of the main focus of a lot of the work in the field, right? And a challenge for us is actually we want to try to, to try something different in, in a way to find a meta strategy which is not, it's not focused on, on a Nash equilibrium. So in, in, in a sense, in that case, the design of reward function itself is already quite, quite challenging. In, in fact, well, in fact, for us, that's actually true. Yeah, but for 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 our approach, but in principle, the so so the reward function channel is given, right? But if, if you want to frame something as a collaborative game, you and you want to, uh, so, so I'm really talking about the things we are thinking about at the moment, is. So, okay, so if you take any game, right, the, re the reward function is given, right? Let's say you play rock, paper, scissors, right? <laughs> you know, if you, if you win, right, you have the reward function, you get a point, right? But now you could ask the game, okay, so we play five people, we play rock, paper, scissors, but in the end, we, we want to fr phrase this as a, as a collaborative, so we have a collaborative aspect of this, right? So let's say uh, three of us play together for something, right? Mm -hmm. and, and then the question becomes, okay, so, so, the reward then obviously has to be distributed with something. It, it has to have different meaning, right? It has basically a private meaning. So I win something, but also like I share part of my reward. And that's actually a challenge we are facing because it's not so clear that like, because that's not given, right? A, a priori, you have to define it somehow. So in, in that sense, yes. So you have to define what, if you want to define, basically if you want to uh, apply this method to something, to a collaborative setting, which is not intrinsically already collaborative, but you want, so basically, there are collaborative settings where the reward function is clear, right? Mm -hmm. But if you want to basically like, apply collaborative setting to a setting where, where it's not necessarily collaborative, right? It's not so clear what the reward function is. That is true. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. That's very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we should stop here. Yeah. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, there is one quick question here, or do we stop? Sorry. Uh, is there one more question? There is one more question from the... Oh, yes, then. Okay. Please go ahead. Uh, okay. Uh, I asked a very quick question. What's the difference between the Kopman scenery and the kernel methods in RKHS? Because in my view, after the embedding, both of them from the dynamics are linear. So I'm wondering what's the difference. Okay, I actually don't have, have the, the formulas here. So, okay, I, I do not know uh, the, a good quick answer to this question. Okay, then maybe we take that offline. 